Well, good morning and welcome to another Wine Steward video. Here we are, the sun is out. I can't wait to get outside in the backyard as soon as I get off today. But in the meantime, let's celebrate sunshine, perhaps by coming up to the wine bar and having a nice dry rosé made of Cabernet Franc. Yep, I'll be telling you about that in a minute. In the meantime, let's tell you about some other things that are not wine. How about that? Did you know the Wine Steward sells beer? You know, we haven't gone whole hog into it yet, but we have an entire door downstairs uh, uh, in the cooler committed to good beer. Beer you might not see absolutely everywhere. And you know, we also sell beer on tap. So virtually everything that we sell upstairs is represented in can or bottle downstairs. But then there are things of which we could never obtain a keg. Things like this. This is a beer that we just bought from one of our favorite wine people, Tom Switzer, who shows us the imports of Charles Neal. Those of you who have heard of Charles Neal, the importer, know that he has a great producer of wine in the Côte, de, in, uh, Côte Roti, in the northern Rhone Valley of France. And Côte Roti is, frankly, in my opinion, some of the best Syrah in the world. What is pretty cool is that guy has started to make his own beer in small quantities. And it comes in these pretty bottles right here by another name, Les Marmots. I've been told by Tom and others that these beers stylistically resemble Chimay beers made by the Trappist monks up in Belgium. Well, I have only had a couple of those and I'm not a beer guy, I'm a wine guy, but the wine, or the beer I should say here, is just friendly and delicious and apparently not to the alcohol level of those Chimay's perhaps. But in that style, whatever that is, um, maybe you beer people should come in and educate me on that. But in the meantime, learn about these two beers Les Marmots, made by a Northern Rhone Syrah producer. How cool is that? So, something new that's not wine at the Wine Steward. Come and get them. Let's remind you that there is another item that's not new to the Wine Steward, but uh, recently revived at the Wine Steward called Burrata. We just got our second shipment of Burrata fresh from Puglia, Italy. We're serving it now on the wine bar, so you can find it on the wine bar menu now. Whereas I said a couple of weeks ago, nope, this first this first wave of burrata is only for the, the uh, cheese cooler downstairs. Well, now we're going to show it to you either way. How about that? So you can have a platter of burrata upstairs at the, at the wine bar, or you can buy it to take home and do it any other way you want. You could put this on a platter. I tend to slice it open. It kind of bursts a little bit like this deflated balloon in a way. It's beautiful, in a way. I, there's different kinds of beauty, right? But I put a, a trickle of olive oil all the way across that cut and maybe sprinkle it with herbs de Provence, maybe some black pepper. There's many, many different treatments. How about dried flower petals? That would be pretty, especially this time of the year. A springy look for burrata. Anyway, it's here. Come and get it. Burrata from Puglia, Italy. Now we will merge into the wine subject, and let's tell you first why this, this theater, this setting is so crowded this time. It's, it's meant to uh, remind me to tell you that some very, very, very precious white and red burgundy is going to be poured for 27 of you next week. We have 10 seats left as of today for our burgundy event, which features the importer himself for the first time the guy who's been selling us these great burgundies is actually gonna be with us. So Jeff Welburn and I and others will be chiming in. We'll be representing 10, 11, 12, maybe even 13 burgundies, white and red, at different price points to you lucky few. We are gonna be using this glass a lot. This is our favorite vessel for burgundy. And uh, those pinots and elegantly made Chardonnays are gonna be shining from that. We're not gonna pour these Overly cold, we are gonna tell you a lot about how we love Burgundy. If you're new to the subject and how to treat it, this is one treatment. The other thing is to not over chill it and, 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 and. We'll tell you things about the place. We're gonna be showing, like I said, several different wines from there, but at different price points, different qualities. And what is specific to this year, this particular year, uh, showing Jeff Welburn, the importer's Burgundies, besides him coming, which is unique, this is cool, um, is the fact that 2021, the vintage that we'll be focusing on, most of the wines are going to be coming from that year, got hit very, very hard by frost, particularly in Burgundy, but really actually all over Europe. You're really got the whole wine Europe got, got um, stricken by bad, bad frost. Does that mean that the quality will be bad from those places? Actually, no. It was a fantastic year for quality, but quantity plummeted. 
and you have much less to go around. So these wines, some of these wines are allocated to the point of only two cases to us. This particular one right here, this Chassani Montmarché Vieille Vigne, that means old vines. We are allowed by Jeff to buy two cases of this. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm hiding it up in my office. We're gonna open two bottles that night. So there goes 22, or no, there goes two of the 24 bottles that were allocated just to share it with you, give you a chance at getting inspired to get in on this allocation. So this night will probably be the only time that some of the wines will be available for sale. In other words, they're not gonna even go down to the display. They're gonna be shown up here and boom, you're gonna order them all, I hope. <laughs> and there are gonna be wines of which there are maybe five uh, cases allocated to us and so on, the, the less expensive, less important wines, but man, they're beautiful. Jeff and Victor and I have gotten together two or three times this year to pre-taste these wines that he has found in Burgundy, France. You should not miss out on that. We put a lot of work into this, a lot of tasting work. <laughs> it's not enjoyable, you know. Um, and then our, our final bit of effort will be representing these wines next Tuesday, April 25th. All right. I think we have nine or 10 seats left. Get in on it. It's 50 bucks a person. I can tell you that nobody else would charge you that little for this lineup of wines. You're going to be trying some fantastic stuff. So it's all relative. You're going to say, well, that's 50 bucks. Uh, you should see what we're pouring. And I promise you, it's going to be magnificent, including this baby right here and this glass right here. But then we'll also have good old Aligote. Do you know Aligote? That's the other white grape of Burgundy. I think it's the one wine that doesn't necessarily need the highfalutin big fat glass. Anyway, we'll be talking about all that. It's going to be fun. It'll be a lot of fun. Next topic, the return. And there's a lot of returning tonight, <laughs> today. Uh, the return of the box boil. Last weekend, you all loved this wine so much. We're so excited by it. When you came up to the wine bar and had a flight of whites from all over the place that you bought us out of this, the two cases of this wine represented in a box boil. That's the name of this bottle shape. And I won't say this time what that's meant to represent, but it's kind of kinky. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is made of Silvaner from Franken, Germany. And uh, many of you have liked it. You're gonna say, that looks weird. Uh, when you taste it, you're not gonna say, that tastes weird. You're gonna say, holy crap, this is good. Those Franken people know how to make a good Silvaner. In fact, it's probably the best Silvaner in the world coming from Franken, Germany. The box boil is back. Next up, let's tell you about the wine bar theme. Let's root through these and tell you that the sparkling wine of the week, as you know, we always have a different bubble on our wine bar every week. This is Mont Marsal from where? Champagne? No. Is it Prosecco? No. It is from Cava. From Cava? What do you mean? From Cava. I thought Cava was like a grape variety or something. I mean, I'm saying that in, with your voice, all right? And I reply, no, Cava is a wine region, kind of like Chianti or Boldo. It is Spain's wine region for their best sparkling wine and their answer to Champagne. It's made like Champagne. It is uh, getting its second fermentation in bottle, has to be in bottle for nine months at least. If it's good old ordinary Cava, like Freshenade or Cordon Bleu, this is not like that. This is a Reserva vintage Cava and it is in bottle for at least 18 months. What does in bottle mean? That's before they take off the crown cap and a little stuff flies out, including the messy stuff. They put a little wine in to fill the bottle back up and then put in the final cork and the wire on top of that. And that is called method traditional because we're not supposed to say method champenoise anymore. The people in Champagne would be very upset if we did. At any rate, the uh, cava is made the same way as champagne and costs you less. This is fantastic Reserva 2021 or 2020 vintage cava uh, made with Parigada, Chirillo, and Macabeo, and a little touch of Chardonnay in this one. And it's good. You know how they do in those cooking shows? They spend maybe four minutes showing you how to cook a particular grandiose dish and then they take something out of the oven and show you the finished products as if they've been taking five hours showing you how to make it. Well, <laughs> I've got the finished product right here. It's kava, baby. That's quite delicious. This is really grown up, mature, complex, uh, food friendly, sparkling wine for all of like, oh my God, $18.99? That's ridiculous. And that's before your wine club discount. Remember, wine club members, you all get 10% off everything you buy here. 
Are you a member yet? Enough commercials. Let's tell you what's in the white flight for the wine bar this weekend. We are going to jump around on that white flight again. It was so fun last time to have this and this and this and this from here and there and there and there that we're going to stick to that themeless theme. How about that? But show you five wines that were not shown last week. So first we're going to take you not so far. We're going to go to the Livermore Valley to the winery of our friends, Stephen and Beth for Locher Cote, which is kind of a alternative brand or a, um, a particular, more specific, specific to one particular great project of Stephen Kent. So what you'll see, uh, whenever you see the name Lotre Cote, you know that you're having a Cab, Cab Franc or a Cabernet Franc based wine, let's say that. But I'll bet you didn't know it came in this color unless you're already hit to this wine that just got here, small production stuff, their first ever Cabernet Franc Blanc. So this wine got off the press so quickly that it derived no color from the skins and they were able to make a white wine out of a red grape. How cool is that? This smells like beautiful uh, Provence Rosé to me. It's got a little more muscle in the mouth, a little more structure. And I think with charcuterie, it would be absolutely fantastic. It's great on its own, but it's got this structure that wants some protein alongside. So think on that. Cabernet Franc from our friends out in uh, Livermore Valley, Stephen Kemp. Next point up, let's go halfway around the world and down in the Southern Hemisphere to South Africa for Simon Sig's Chenin Blanc, the most planted white grape of South Africa is represented in this affordable and delicious dry Chenin Blanc. Beautiful fruit, lemon curd uh, qualities and not sweet. So don't worry, the best grape in the world can be dry, but we call it the best grape in the world just to uh, start a conversation up at the wine bar. So Simon Sig Chenin Blanc, South Africa, wine number two. Wine number three, something you have heard of before. Uh, no, 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 actually, let's not do that yet. I spent some time at the desk shuffling these tastes uh, and figuring out what sequence might work. We don't want any one of these wines to not have their voice. And sometimes the wine that comes before kind of messes up the wine that comes next. So I figured that we should do this wine, which is also based on Chenin Blanc, but from closer to home. The Chenin Blanc in here, of which I believe there's 50%, is from Clarksburg, in the Delta here in California. And then there are some other players as well. So this is a blend from Gros Ventre called High Mountain White. I think it is High Country White. Small production stuff from very thoughtful people. They have a tasting room, I believe, up in Healdsburg. Never been, but we like their idea of uh, small production, hundreds of cases, not thousands, good wine shop stuff. This is the kind of thing you will not see elsewhere unless you take a hike up to Healdsburg. Nice white wine based on the best grape in the world, Chenin Blanc. Now let's go to something else you've heard of, but man, we're jumping around. Let's go to Sancerre, shall we? We used this at a uh, recent Wines of the Old World wine class on uh, France, yeah, because why wouldn't you show a Sancerre in a class on France? But the rest of you haven't seen this new vintage of Domaine Dolony yet, so this is Dolony's Sancerre. Sancerre is the name of the location. That's what we would have told you in the class. The French tend to name their wines by location. And uh, what's in a Sancerre? There's a requirement. It must be 100% Chenin Blanc. What is it when it's red? Red Sancerre, yeah, it's out there, is Pinot Noir. And it's kind of stubborn stuff. But look for pink Sancerre. That's also Pinot Noir. That's Pinot Noir Rosé from Sancerre. And it's quite good. I hope to be bringing one in soon. In the meantime, there's Dolny Sancerre, the white stuff, 100% Sauvignon Blanc, vibrant. You get the nice flintiness, minerality should always be a component of good Sancerre, but the fruit is peachy and good and it's nice and dry and lively and wakes up the palate, goes great with goat cheese and all that, okay? Final wine, a Chardonnay. Oh my God, don't run away. No, it's good Chardonnay. This is good Chardonnay from William Nuttall. William Nuttall uh, spends a, a ha one half of the year up here making great Cabernet. We are putting his Cabernet in our Red Collector Wine Club this month and making fantastic Chardonnay and so other varieties, and then he goes down to Salta, Argentina. No, not Mendoza. Somewhere higher than Mendoza, somewhere higher than three or 4,000 feet. Salta goes and plants its grapevines at seven to eight or 9,000 feet, believe it or not. So William Nuttall makes wine down there too. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Anyway, uh, this is brilliant Chardonnay, Russian River, generosity. That knows when to stop. Anyway, good stuff, good end of the white flight. Or just order a glass of it. That's why we do this. You know, we, I tucked in a Chardonnay for two reasons, because it's good and because some of you just want to come upstairs and have a glass of Chardonnay. And you'll find that in the white flight and say, do I have to buy the flight? No, you can have a glass of Chardonnay. 
There it is. And now let's show you about two things that you must order glasses of <laughs> because we do that on the menu. We want you to experience wines by the glass a couple of times. No, you cannot have a two ounce pour of this. You must experience this dry rosé as a glass and you will not mind one bit. Once you have one sip, you're saying, man, I'm glad I ordered a glass of that. This is Domaine de Griamont. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, Domaine de Griamont, whatever the hell that means. But I can tell you what's in it. This is 100% Cabernet Franc. There's that name again from the Loire Valley of France. So it's delicious, non-Provence, dry rosé from France. How about that? Good juice. Next up, well, because I still have a good heap of it downstairs, I'll just keep bringing it upstairs and you guys like it every time we pour it. So experience an entire glass of Domaine de Plutivie, which is our own baby. Adam Webb made this for us. We had some intellectual participation. <laughs> Adam and I discussed where it would be from, what it would be made of, how we would ferment. So we were involved in the making of this wine. This is 60% Carignan, 40% Moved from very, very old vines, some of the oldest vines in California, located about 30 miles as the crow flies in that direction. In Oakland, California. Yeah, believe it or not, some of the oldest vines are there. Why? Because they have survived uh, the, way, uh, the onslaught of phylloxera, the root louse that destroyed all the other vines in California, could not abide the sand in the, uh, the Delta Sands of Oakley. And so the vines that were planted there so long ago persist to this day. They look like hell, but they put out a great crop, as you'll taste from Domaine de Plus-de-Vie. Or you could say plus de vie. I'm told by the French that it's more positive if you say plus de vie, not plus de vie. You can say it either way, but if you say plus de vie, it sounds like you're dying and you need more life. That's, that doesn't sound too great. I digress. Here we go. Let's tell you about the red flag. Let's take you to the Rhone Valley of France. More specifically, the Southern Rhone Valley of France is represented in all five of this week's uh, wine bar red flight. And we're going to start with good old Côte d'Arone by La Salatude. This is a producer of Chateauneuf de Pop. We can all be drinking Chateauneuf de Pop every night of the week. We need our Tuesday night wine, and that's what this means to be. This is a beautiful blend of Grenache Sarama Bed, La Salatude, affordable, good old Côte d'Arone is wine number one. This is a wine that just got here yesterday. It just landed. I read about it, and I said, I got to have some of that. We've carried other wines from this brand before called uh, Domaine Fond de Croze. They are at the northern part of the Southern Rhone Valley, if you can keep track of that. And they make several different blends of G and S and M. And then they make this, which is 100% G. In other words, 100% Grenache is going on here. It's rather robust and, and dark and rich for 100% Grenache. You would expect something lighter in color, something that they do. Maybe they ripen more, maybe they extract more fruit by uh, cold soaking. I don't know, but this is rather impactful Grenache for 20 bucks before your wine club discount. So good stuff, 100% Grenache. Uh, is the, uh, by the way, it's a Coderone Vaison La Romaine. So some of you have heard of the village Vaison La Romaine. I know a few of you have even stayed there in uh, the northern part of the south of France. Well, this is a Coderone Village level wine from there. Wine number three, another thing uh, that some people will find uh, rather familiar, uh, is this wine that we've been showing you for years. I love this label. Beautiful, antique looking label. <laughs> Lirac, the name of the village is proudly proclaimed in like uh, North Pole fig figures, and it's uh, one of my favorite wines year after year. In 2019, which is happening here, it's darker and richer. It's very intense wine. It's gonna be uh, Grenache with a, a healthy amount of Syrah, like 30% of Syrah is playing along with the gra Grenache. And the rest is Senso, C-I-N-S-A-U-L-T. Senso appears in a lot of Rhone wines, whether or not it's on the back label, uh, identified there. And this is generous. This is impactful. I would have this with barbecue this weekend. The sun will be out, doggone it. Great stuff. Nice people too. Um, you're gonna go next, if you're doing this red flight with us, to Gigodas. Gigodas is second only to Chateauneuf de Pop in renown in the uh, southern Rhone Valley of France. And it's about, oh, 15 minutes drive away from Chateauneuf de Pop. It is different from Chateauneuf de Pop. Sometimes it's kind of a relief. Chateauneuf can be a bruiser. It's a big wine that you have to kind of like get your mind set for. But Gigodas is more often a little more lean, a little more classy, one could say. This one is, especially because it's 2017 vintage, a vintage that was not like 
overachieving like 16 and 19 and also it's a, you know it's got a little bit of time on it this is almost six year old wine that is now settling down almost into phase two it's getting its savories it's nice wine from Bougeasseau Domaine uh, de Grand Bougeasseau we just had the lovely couple who makes this wine young lady uh, and man met uh, when they were uh, signing up for tango lessons somewhere in the Rhone Valley, and uh, they decided to become winemakers in Gigadas. How about that? The final wine. Yes, we finally got there. <laughs> we're going to have Chateau Neuf de Pop. How could we not have Chateau Neuf de Pop in a southern Rhone wine tasting, and how could it not be the Grand Finale? So this one's from uh, Roger Perrin, Domaine Roger Perrin. No relation, no, no close relation to the uh, Perrin family of Beaucastel, but located near there, ironically. Uh, in northern Chateauneuf-du-Pape, Domaine Roger Perrin. Love this. Again, it's a 2019, the year of generosity. And uh, yet this is a producer of uh, conservative styling. So it's kind of fun to see that meet that. And uh, let's see what happens, shall we? Come up to the wine bar soon. Come get your burrata. Especially now that the sun is out, you can have this out on the patio with a little olive oil uh, trickled along it. The box boil is back. The burgundy tasting, don't forget. We're going to open this box and pull out two bottles and show them to you and hopefully sell you the other 22. How about that? Thank you very much and have a great weekend.